Okay, tonight we're going to start in Revelation chapter 8, and uh, we'll just talk about a couple of these things. In Revelation chapter 8, the first section, 1 through 5, ties into chapter 6, where the, the seal judgments were opened. And in chapter 8, verse 1 through 5, is the seventh seal. So you remember, there's the seal judgments, there's the trumpet judgments, and there's the bowl judgments. And... With the seal and the trumpet judgments, the last judgment, as in the seventh seal, opens the seven trumpet judgments. And then you'll see in, in a little bit, when we get down to the seventh trumpet, it opens the seven bold judgments. So they just kind of, and that's over in uh, chapter 16. So it just kind of leads one into the other. And as I had mentioned to you last week, and I forgot to do it, and I'll try to do it, over the holidays, so when we come back in January, the timeline, and the best timeline that you can follow is these judgments because they just they follow one after the other, and then everything else just kind of fits in there with, with the rest of them. And so he, in chapter 8, again, verse 1 through 5, he opens these, these seven trumpet judgments. In verse 6, he says, And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow. And the first angel blew his trumpet, and hell and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. So a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And then the second angel. And all of these things that happened, remember what I told you, and, and I wanted to stress this. Remember that this is God's judgment. This is not something that happens because Satan is loose on earth or anything like that. This is, this is God's judgment. Because the people of the earth have rejected him as Lord and Savior, and they've rejected his grace. And then in, if, if he goes through the trumpets, and I'm not going to go through each one of them and, and talk about them, but go on uh, to chapter 9 in verse 1 through 12, and there's something particular here that we want to look at. And this is the fifth trumpet. And he says, The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and the key to the shaft to the abyss was given to him. Well, we're going to talk about that in, in just a minute, that abyss. And uh, you might your uh, translation might say the bottomless pit. And in the Greek, it is two words. It's, it's, and I don't know why the Christian standard just translated it one word, the abyss, uh, possibly because one of the two words in Greek is abyssios, which we get the word abyss from. But we'll talk about that in just a minute. And it says, he opened the shaft to the abyss, and smoke came up from the shaft like from a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Then locusts came up out of the smoke onto the earth, and power was given to them like the power that scorpions have on the earth. Notice again, God's sovereignty, God is in control, that it says power was given to them. They were allowed to do this. That word power could be translated authority or the right to. They couldn't do anything until God allowed them to. Verse 4, and this just, just furthers that point. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill them, but were to torment them for five months. And their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it stings someone. And then verse 6, In those days people will seek death and will not find it, and they will long to die, but death will flee from them. So there's a couple of things here at the, the first paragraph in your notes. That word abyss, it, it's two words, and the first word, the Greek word is abyss, and the second Greek word is, is the word for nether or for lower. So this is the, the lower part, and I put out beside it, literally, it means the pit of the abyss. Now, this is one of those things, if you reading through the Bible, and Peter mentions this, and, and Paul mentions it in, I believe, in the book of Philippians, but Paul mentions it like this. He says, and he was Lord of everything. And power, or speaking of Jesus, and authority was given, given him over all dominions, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. 
And that's what this is talking about, this pit, this abyss. This is not, and, and I understand that this is not the lake of fire, okay? And, and we'll see that when we get to the end of Revelation. And I've also got you a note in here about that. But this is not the lake of fire. This is just an abyss, a, a pit, the bottomless pit, if you would. It's used in the New Testament to refer to the abode of demons and are the dead. Okay, now, you remember in Luke chapter 8, 31, I put you a couple of notes out here, a couple of references. Remember in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, and in several other places when Jesus would confront demon-possessed people and the demons would speak to him, remember they would always say something like this, why have you come to torment us before our time? And in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, in particular, they said, have you come to send us to the abyss? So they know that that's their, their place. They know that that's where they're going. And then if you would, Romans chapter 10, verse 7, and it, it's used in a different way here. But let me turn over there real quick. Romans chapter 10, verse 7. In beginning in verse 6, he says, Paul speaking, he says, but the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, and that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So Paul likens it or, or places it also where dead people are, where people that have died, where their, their souls or their spirits are. And so that tells you that that's where lost people also go. Now, if you remember in the book of Matthew, Jesus makes this statement when talking about hell. He says hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for people. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. So those people that reject Jesus Christ and choose to follow Satan, which is what you're doing if you reject Jesus Christ, then that's your place too. When lost people die in this life, and as I've said before, let's don't use the word die. When lost people ceased to function in this world, they go to this pit. We call it hell. The Bible doesn't call it hell. There's another word that's used for hell, talked about in some other places, but this is where they go, to the abode of the dead, to the nether world, the lower world. And this is where Satan and his angels are also. You remember in Jude chapter 6 that Jude tells us that those angels that left their first abode, and he's talking about Genesis chapter 6, those angels that came down to earth and married women, they have been held in darkness unto the day of judgment in this place and that's where they are and i wonder as we read through the book of revelation if some of these creatures that are called up from the the bottomless pit from this this abyss if that's not maybe some of those angels and if it was can you imagine how mad they'd be after all those years that's been six thousand it's been Almost 10,000 years, eight to 10,000 years, they've been held in chains in this, this lower place, this place of fire and smoke and brimstone, and now they're let out. So no wonder it, it's so bad on earth when all of this happens. So they come up out of this pit, and the last thing I, I want to tell you about that, if you'll notice that uh, under that first paragraph, that one little line, all of this, all this bottomless pit, all of this abyss, all of this will be thrown into the lake of fire at the end of time. And you can read that in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. It says, then death and hell are Hades, which is the Greek word translated out of the Septuagint, meaning hell or the netherworld. All of those things will be thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, we were talking last night and uh, somebody asked me about uh, the lost people and their bodies. And will they be resurrected like we are? And the answer is yes. And we'll see that when we get to the end of the chapter, of the book to the great white throne. But there is coming a day, and Jesus mentions this. He said there's coming a day when, when all of the dead will hear the voice and they will all rise again. 
Those that have done righteousness will rise to eternal life, and those that have done wickedness will rise to eternal judgment. Right before the great white throne, which will be at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, the battle of Armageddon, and then the great white throne, all of the lost people that have died will be resurrected, just like we will be resurrected. They will receive an eternal body, just like we receive an eternal body. They will stand before the great white throne. They will be judged, and we'll see that when we get to the book of Revelation, the end of the book of Revelation, and then they will be condemned and they will be thrown into the lake of fire, along with Satan, the Antichrist, all the demons, death, hell, the abyss, all of this, everything that has to do with wickedness will be thrown into the lake of fire. And we'll cover that a little bit more in detail when we get there. And then after these, it calls them locusts. After they are released from this, this abyss, this pit, they come up on the earth and they begin to, to go about. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to harm the grass of the earth, the green plants and the trees. But notice in verse 4 what he tells them. He says, only those people who do not have God's seal in their forehead. Okay, up to this point, the people that he's talking about have got to be the 144,000. And we saw that back in uh, what, chapter 7. That will be in uh, the first part of chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, where God calls out 144,000 Israelites. And he marks them. He seals them in their head. And they go about throughout the earth being evangelists, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of those that, that receive Jesus through their ministry, and we saw two groups of those. We saw one group in chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, and we saw one group in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. All of those that receive Jesus Christ during the time of the tribulation, most of them will be killed. They, they will be hunted down. Uh, in, in chapter 7, I, I don't, in chapter 6, I don't know so much that it is, is from the hand of the Antichrist, but he allows it. But you remember we talked about in verse 4 of chapter 6, it says, Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its rider was allowed to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given him. And then we looked at the end of chapter 6 in verse 15 and 16, and we saw that all of these people during this beginning of the tribulation, they know who's doing this. They know who's causing this because it says, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb because the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand. So they know that God is doing this. They understand that, that God is judging the world and rather than repent, as we're going to see in, in many other places, they blaspheme God. They curse God for this. And since they can't get to God to take out their anger, to take out their hatred on, who are they going to turn it on? Christians, those who have received Jesus Christ. And that's going to be these people in Revelation chapter 6, 9 through 11, and chapter 8, 1 through 5. And that's what Satan's doing today. Satan learned and understood on the cross and because of Jesus' resurrection that he can't hurt God. He can't get to God. And so the next best thing is to come against God's people. And we, just like these people, have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I've showed you that two or three times, but if you want to, Ephesians chapter 1, because this is such a, a powerful truth that we need to get a hold of. Ephesians chapter 1, and beginning in verse 13. And you need to mark these verses, get them down in your spirit, something. Ephesians 1, verse 13, in him... You also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. 
So right now, you and me, as children of God, what sets us apart from the rest of the world? What makes us different from everybody else in this world? We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. So no matter what happens... No matter what Satan deceives the world into doing, no matter what God gives Satan the right and the authority to do, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And Satan can only go so far and he can only do so much. You can find this all the way through the Bible. And I've listed you several other uh, verses and passages how that God's people are always treated different, all the way back even to the book of Exodus and when Moses and Pharaoh were going head to head and Moses was bringing all of these signs and wonders and you can go back and read and there are several of them that specifically say, for example, you'll recall one of the plagues was darkness and the Bible talks about that it was so dark that you couldn't even see your hand in front of you. The darkness was just that dark. But it says there was light in Israel. There was light in Goshen where the, the people of Israel were. Some of the plagues that came, it didn't even hurt Israel's flocks and herds. All it did was hurt the people of Exodus. And then in Ezekiel chapter 9, there's another example of God marking his people. And when his judgment came, it didn't come on his people. It only came on those who were not his people. And then look at verse 6. And to me, this is pretty telling of, of how bad it's going to be in the tribulation. And it says, in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. So two things about that. Number one, it, it's going to be terrible. It, it's got to be bad for people that they're looking for death. They're wanting to die. And I just, in my head, I'm just imagining that they're, some of them, they're probably trying to commit suicide. You know, it talks about how they ran to the rocks and to the mountains and said, fall on us. So maybe they're trying, but they can't. The second thing that this tells us is that this shows that God is still in control of everything. And when I say everything, I mean also life and death. God gives life, and God decides when we die. Now think about that for a minute, because these people are trying to die. They're doing everything they can. That's, that's kind of what it indicates. It says when they seek death. They're doing everything they can to die, to get out of these judgments that are coming upon the earth, all of these plagues and these things that are happening, and they can't. And the only reason they can't die is because God said, no, you're not going to die. You're going to live because you rejected my grace and my gospel. So we need to remember as we read through all of this, these things that, that God is in control of all of this, right down to the smallest details. And we need to take as children of God, already seeing that we are sealed, we're protected, we've got the Holy Spirit on us, we are a part of God's plan and a part of God's purpose, that when it comes our time to die, that when it comes our time to cease to function on this earth, number one, God knows it and God has appointed it. The book of Psalms says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Number two, the book of Psalms, chapter 23. When I go through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord will be right there. He will meet me and carry me through and be with me. So as we face whatever we face in life, no matter what it is, know and understand that God knows what you're going through. God has, and, and I hate to say this because people get there, but God has allowed it in that Nothing happens without his okay. Even all of these demons that come up out of this bottomless pit, they can't do anything until God says, okay, it's time. Now do what you're going to do. And then thirdly, know that no matter what you're going through, 
even if it leads to your death, that God is with you because you are his child. You are sealed by his Holy Spirit. Then look at uh, chapter 9 and verse 15. Any questions or comments up to now? Chapter 9, verse 15. And this just kind of carries the, the point that I was talking about. And begin in verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God, I heard a voice say to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, and then this is the, the point, but in, in the Christian standard it says, so the four angels who were prepared for the hour, day, month, and year were released to kill a third of the human race. Now, does your translation say that or say something simple? I know yours does. <laughs> third part of, say the third part of men. Yeah, but they were prepared yeah. for that. And, and notice, he doesn't just say that time, at least in the Christian standard. So he says for that man. hour, for that day, for that month, and for that year. Mm -hmm. Do you see how in control of all of this God is? Everything happens according to God's purpose and God's plan. Now, just another quick aside, quick point here. Verse 14 says, release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. Ha have you seen, um, uh, the Euphrates is in the news big time right now. It's drying up. Matter of fact, it's almost completely dry. There are places where you can literally walk across it right now. And there's all kinds of reports. First of all, if you go on YouTube and, and, and search for the Euphrates River or maybe the Euphrates River drying up, you're going to find all kinds of prophetic things. And there are prophets out there that, that right now they're saying this is it because the Euphrates dried up and they're pointing to all these verses and everything. You're also going to find that there are several of them, that there are several uh, places, and some of them are not prophets. They're just people. They're hearing all kinds of noises coming out of the riverbed from the Euphrates. Now, None of them have actually recorded it and put it on YouTube, but they're saying they're hearing all kinds of things. They found a couple of caves that they didn't know existed, and they're hearing voices out of those caves and all this kind of stuff. I can't verify any of that, okay? But I do know that in the Euphrates River, somewhere, and I'm thinking it's in this pit, I'm thinking the abyss is somewhere under that area, so you might say, well, Brother Don, you really think that abyss is in the earth? That's what the Bible says. Remember, Jesus is the, the authority over things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. So yes, I believe it's in the earth. That's where these four angels came from. They, they came out of that place from under the river Euphrates. And then in verse 16, this is something else, and I put this in your notes just to give you something to think about and something to look at. In verse 16, it says the, the number of mounted troops was 200 million. And he said, I heard their number. Okay, the reason why I point this out, a lot of people, a, a lot of a question, it's what part does China play in the end time? And China is not mentioned as in China, just like the United States is not mentioned anywhere in prophecy. China's not either. Now, China existed back during all of this as, as the East countries, the United States, did not exist in that sense back then. A lot of people think that verse 16 is talking about China. It's talking about the Chinese army. And the reason being, and you probably remember this, several years ago, it, in particular, if I remember right, it was Newsweek or Time Magazine. They came out with this big article about China, and they said China now has a 200 million man army that they can put into service whenever they want to. And so everybody immediately went to this verse and said, oh, this is, this is China. I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because, number one, it takes place during the sixth 
trumpet. We've still got the seventh trumpet and the bowl judgments to go through. But then number two, because of the way he explains it here in this passage, he goes on and he said, this is how I saw the horses and their riders in the vision. And so somebody say, okay, well, look, he saw horses and riders. That, that means it was men. It was people on these horses. Yeah, but remember how he explained the locusts that came up out of the smoke and the brimstone. And he described them as having the face of a man, the hair of a woman, and, and all this. He didn't know how to describe what he was seeing. He was doing the best he could. But some of these things that he was seeing and thinking about, they never even entered his mind. I mean, think about back in, in, in Zechariah and in Peter, there's a couple of places that, that people say, okay, he's describing a nuclear explosion. And he well may be. I'm not saying yes or no. But think about if you lived in the days of Peter, back, back in A.D. 60, 70, 80, and in a vision, you saw a city and a nuclear explosion. How would you describe it? Or let's say you were John and you had a vision of the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, now think about it in, in our day. Okay, right? The, the war in, in, in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia right now, the tanks, the trucks, the planes, the drones the satellite connections and uplinks and all of this kind of stuff, the weapons that the soldiers have today. But you live in 60 A.D. How would you describe it? I mean, all you know is carts and donkeys and camels and swords, basically. That's all you know. How would you describe it? Well, that's what you're reading here with John. And he says, the number of the mounted troops, he says, was 200 million, and I heard their number, and this is how I saw the horses and their riders in the vision. They had breastplates that were fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. The heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. Okay, well, you could say, okay, well, that was because they were running and their manes were flowing out behind them. I can deal with that, but he says, from their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. So you got you to gotta wonder, is, is he really describing men riding horses? And then he goes on and talks about what they do. So I don't think this is China. I think this is some type of demonic invasion that comes up from this abyss led by these four angels. Now, in your notes... I gave you another place, and that's in Revelation chapter 16. And if you'll turn over there, in Revelation chapter 16, at the sixth bowl, and if China is in prophecy, this is where they are, to my understanding. And so he says, the sixth poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Euphrates again. Now, with this being the sixth bowl, we're getting to the end of the tribulation period now. We're getting through the seven years, and, and it's almost to the very end. And so he says, this angel poured out his bowl, the sixth bowl, on the great river Euphrates. And watch this. What, is, what happens to the Euphrates? It dries up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So who's on the east side of the Euphrates? Well, China is. China, India, some of those others. And then you got all the Muslim countries up and down the Euphrates. And he says, Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming from the dragon's mouth, from the beast mouth, and from the mouth of the false prophet. For they are demonic spirits performing signs, and here's what they do, who travel to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. So if China is in prophecy, this is where they're at. But who else is here? What other nation is here with China? All the nations of the world. Because it says he sends these demonic spirits to all the kings of the whole world to assemble them. And what he's assembling them for is the Battle of Armageddon. 
and then right after that you'll see the seventh bowl and and that's going to lead right into the return of Jesus Christ the second coming of Christ to destroy all nations and we'll look at that when we when we get over there so if that comes up you you get faced with that question or that thought well there you go that's China China's going to be at the end. God's going to dry up the river Euphrates. Well, could the river Euphrates drying up right now? Could that be a part of it? It could be, but the river Euphrates right now is drying up because of drought, but it's also drying up because up above the river, Iraq and some of these other countries, they're building dams and they're cutting off the flow. So I think it's a combination of things. I think in Revelation chapter, where were we, um, 16, I think that's a God thing when it happens then. So that's just my opinion. You, you have to study that out and take it on your own. So that's, that's where I think China will be. The only other thing I really want to look at tonight is as we've gone through now, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments is the second paragraph from the end, and it's the people. It's their response and their attitudes. And I put out there beside that, there are really only two kinds of people in the world. There are those that have submitted to God and those that haven't. And what we're going to see when we go through the book of Revelation, as we're doing, is we're going to see the attitudes and the way they act. First of all, in chapter 6, verse 15 through 16, we've read that several times. They said, fall on us and hide us. From the great day, from the one who was seated on the Lamb and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. They refused to repent. They wouldn't turn to God. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 8, you see the 144,000 Jews that were sealed. And then in chapter 7, verse 9 through 17, you see the Gentiles that received Jesus Christ. So there's your two groups right there. Chapter 6, those that refused Christ. Chapter 7, those that have submitted to Christ. Chapter 9 and verse 4. Then they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. Look at verse 6. And in those days, people will seek death but will not find it. These are those that are under God's judgment. Chapter 9, verse 20 through 21. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues, and watch this, they did not repent of the works of their hands. And you see, all the way up even to the midpoint of the tribulation and then on past the midpoint, God's opportunity for grace is still there. He's got people preaching the gospel. He's got angels flying all around the world preaching the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. These people on earth know who is causing this, and Antichrist is telling them who's causing this. But it says they refuse to repent of the works of their hands, to stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk, and they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their, their thefts. And then... One last in chapter 16, and chapter 16 is after the midpoint. This is after Antichrist has revealed himself. He's the beast now. He's actually trying to destroy Israel. Chapter 16, verses uh, 9, and people were scorched by the intense heat, so they blasphemed the name of God. And, who, and look at and it further, it says, so they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. And then verse 11, verse 10, the fifth poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. The people gnawed their tongues because of their pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven. I can't imagine that, being in this situation, knowing that God is doing this, having the Antichrist tell you that God is doing this, having all of these 
people preaching the gospel, having angels preaching the gospel and still refusing to receive Jesus Christ, but rather blaspheming the God of heaven. So what can we learn from all of this? Because there is things for us to learn. I want to give you four things. I've listed them for you at the bottom of your notes. Number one, God has appointed a time and a place for everything according to his purpose. And we're going to see that all the way up until the very end of the book of Revelation. Number two, God's people are always marked. They're always singled out. And even though they may face trials and persecution, they are always protected. Number three, God will honor his word. If he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If he makes a promise to his people, he'll keep that promise. And then number four, you don't want to be here when all of this happens. You don't want to be here. You don't want your family to be here. You don't want your friends to be here. You don't want anything to do with this. So the answer is receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior right now. Any questions or any comments? Anything? All right, then. Well, thank you for being here tonight.